is Robert Sherman in western Ukraine. Our team is heading to take a closer look at what is happening in Ukraine as this war with Russia rages on. See you on the other side. Come with me now. Now here we are, the country that 7 million people are trying to flee. We're here. Go with me now. Total impact that war has on a populace. This is it right here. Air raid sirens are going off right now. Go with me now. In Western Ukraine, I'm Robert Sherman. I have to tell you, I've, I've really never been in a situation before uh, where there was just so much tension that was in the air the moment that you walked into a situation. And I'll, I'll give you an example from our first day that we went to Ukraine. Um, so we were actually down on the U.S.-Mexico border when the invasion began. And all of a sudden, nobody cared about the U.S.-Mexico border when all of this started to happen. So they called us and said, would you have interest in going? And I said, yes, I, I, would, do, I would absolutely do that. And the next day, we were on a flight to Europe. Uh, landed in Poland. And a couple of days later, we cross into Ukraine. So that was probably day three of the invasion, which is where tensions were truly at their apex. And I'll never forget like this first image that you see, you know, as we're crossing into Ukraine, uh, we are the only car <laughs> that is going into Ukraine. And we're looking on the other side of the port of entry. And there is this line of cars that is 14 miles long. It looked like a scene out of the walking dead that just desperately trying to get out of the country. Some people are, their cars are running out of gas. So they're throwing them on the side of the road and they're walking 30 miles, you know, to, to get to the Polish Ukrainian line. And they're standing in these lines in the 25, 30 degree uh, Eastern European cold mm -hmm. just to get in. And, you know, when, when we were actually trying to get into Ukraine, we saw this one scene right at the beginning where evidently this Ukrainian's, uh, his papers were not being processed correctly. And it looked as though the Poles were not going to let this person into the country. And we see this person make a break for it and like ends up getting tackled and pushed down by the Ukrainian border guard. But, you know, I mean, to see the desperation of humanity is something that you don't often see, you know, in, in the United States, you, we, we, we don't see that very often. Um, but there were all these people who believed that their lives depended on it. Um, so that immediately set the tone heading into Ukraine. And we start driving through the country. And every 30 minutes or so, we would come up to one of these checkpoints. Uh, and they were run by the local Ukrainian militia. So this would not be the Ukrainian military. This would be like if you know, like local volunteers from Rochester, New York or something oh. like that were, you know, like like holding the line. And this was like their like perspective, like the war ends at Rochester, like they're they're not going to get past us here. Oh, you know, these aren't great soldiers. It's just very interesting dynamic. Um, but those are where tensions were at some of the highest, you know, and yeah, you know, every car pulls up and they demand to see your papers and want to know where you're going, what you're doing, what time you're going to be there. And I asked my field producer, you know, what, what are they doing here? You know, what is the purpose of all these checkpoints? And he said, well, they're looking for Russian spies and saboteurs. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's never been in that situation before, I thought that that was crazy, that it's like, wow, like they're look like it's like straight out of like a James Bond film or something like that. Like they're they're looking for <laughs> spies and, you know, like the, the Russian, you know, secret service and things like that. You know, it's just something I've never I've always been foreign to. So we, we get through a few of these checkpoints and we get into our first city in Ukraine, which is ivano frankivsk which is in the western portion of the country. And we get in late at night and like immediately go to bed. It's probably like four o'clock in the morning. And then about nine o'clock in the morning, we wake up to this loud knocking on the door and we open it up and it's three Ukrainian soldiers who are clad in flak jackets, helmets, full assault rifles and and they, they come into our room, you know, looking all over the place, like checking under the beds and behind the doors and everything like that. And they're demanding to see our papers. Wow. So what had happened is, is that somebody clearly reported us because we looked so out of place. You know, I mean, none of us speak Ukrainian, um, all have foreign clothing labels, have a foreign car, you know, paying in cash, just like all these things that looked out of place. You know, third day of the invasion, everybody's guilty until proven innocent. Hmm. I'm and sure. so um, I'm the only American in our group. We have a camera crew that's from Poland, 
We have security and translators who are from Ukraine. My field producer is from New Zealand. And then there's me from the United States. And so they're going down the line and, you know, looking at everybody's papers and it like, it looks like it's all normal. And this one Ukrainian soldier comes to me, takes one look at my American passport, looks down and says, CIA, huh? <laughs> and it, it, that one, I'm like, what? You know, I'd be mean, like, I don't work for the CIA, you know? And I just think that it's a joke. And, uh, you know, everybody's kind of like nervously laughing and this guy is just not laughing. He's mm. just like, has like this stoic grin like this stoic, this very, you know, firm face. And then he says CIA. And it's like, at that moment, it's like, re remember the day before they're looking for Russian spies and everything <laughs> like that. And I'm thinking like, oh no, this is not going to end well. You know, that it's like, yeah, guilty until proven innocent. And like holds this stare with our whole group and everybody is just stone cold quiet. And then says, no, nah, I'm just messing with you, man. You're good to go. <laughs> leave. You know, so I, I, it is like, but I mean, that was just like a testament to like the tensions that we saw over there. Um, it, it, that wasn't the only time that we were detained by uh, Ukrainian soldiers. There was another time we were sitting in a cafe uh, over in Ivano Frankisk. Like we're all sitting around having dinner and there's like eight of these secret police officers for the Ukrainians uh, who come into this cafe and they surround us. And there's, there's even one guy who like clearly like had like a hand on his gun inside of his like jacket, you know, and they're telling us to put our phones in the middle of the table and our laptops in the middle of the table. And uh, like, they're like, you know, like you need to come outside with us right now. We have some questions for you. Um, none of these guys spoke English though. So they brought in this guy, his name was Vlad, which I've learned is like the name of one out of every three Ukrainians. <laughs> over the country. And this guy had like this very like Bond villain type mannerisms, like very meticulous with his words. And, you know, so he's the only one who speaks English. And he's like, well, you know, you are out of place in Ukraine and, you know, there is a war going on. So we must search you, you know, and see, you know, if you are a Russian spy or not, you know. And it's, <laughs> so, they're, so they're like going like through all this and like they're checking all of our papers and everything. And, uh, you know, they, they end up clearing us, you know, but we were like, you know, like, what, why did you guys like come after us? You know, like, like, why did you guys like come into this cafe? And, you know, Vlad is just like, well, you know, you showed up on Russian Reddit. And I was just like, what does that mean? You know, and lo and behold, there's a photo of our car on Russian Reddit and it has the words press written on the side of it, which is what you're supposed to do to stay safe in a war zone. And like our, our translators going through all these comments on this photo uh, and it's just like, you know, there's a Polish license plates. People are like, you know, like the, the car is a Polish license plate. People are like, they, they, it's foreign license plates, clearly spies. You know, uh, there was uh, our, one of our cameramen backed the car into a tree, so broke a light on it. And uh, like somebody else commented, like, no self-respecting journalist would have a car with a broken tail light on it. Clearly Russian spies. You know, <laughs> There's like 50 comments, you know, and like everybody, you know, playing psychologist saying like, yeah, these these guys are spies, you know, go after them. But I mean, it was just that's just what the the tension was like all over the country. Um, you know, it's just like especially right at the initial onset of the invasion, um, everybody was guilty until proven innocent. And, and in the Ukrainians defense, um, they actually did. Uh, Vlad was telling us that they actually did arrest. Uh, six Russian spies who were posing as American journalists mm -hmm. with American journalism credentials. Um, so, I mean, that puts everything in perspective, but that that's what the situation was like. And, you know, we had to deal with that for the entire time that we were there, but uh, it's just something that you'll never forget. You know, you'll, you'll, ne you'll never forget being detained by the Ukrainian military. Well, thanks for those stories. That was great. Uh, it sounds like it was culture shock with a lot of tension. And uh, a realization that in a war zone, all bets are off for right. normalcy. Uh, and, and you could find yourself in a precarious situation very suddenly, uh, right. not, not just from explosions and bombs, but from the kind of things you talked about. Did you ever encounter uh, any explosions nearby? Was that something that you had to be concerned about as well? We actually got pretty lucky. So first of all, you know, to... To be abundantly clear, we stayed in Western Ukraine, cities such as Lviv, Lutsk, Ivano-Frankivsk. Uh, so we were not in the heart of the battle. Like you saw some of like the like Clarissa Ward from CNN, Trey Yinks from Fox and Benjamin Hall, who 
ended up getting severely injured over there. We were not in mm -hmm. Kiev or Kharkiv or anything like that. So just to make that clear. Um, but I, I will tell you the thing that was for me first time in those instances is that the first time you hear those air raid sirens go off. And I mean, it is, they, they just echo throughout the whole city. And it's just like this very creepy sound that is unmistakable. Um, and w when those go off, it means that a long range missile or planes are in the air that are coming to that general region, the assumption that you're gonna get bombed. And the first time you have to run to the air raid shelters uh, is, is pretty scary. Um, we got very lucky that it seemed as though that everywhere that we were the day after we left that city got bombed you know and oh. for the most part it was like a, for the most part it was airports and military establishments um you know that that's what was happening in western ukraine a lot of that military infrastructure was being destroyed um eastern ukraine was a very different story cities like kharkiv mariupol the capital of kiev i mean those the, those poor people were just subject to incessant bombings all the time. Right. Um, so we, we, we got uh, a sliver of that, um, but not nearly to the extent that some people did who were in Eastern Ukraine from the beginning of the war.